we will be uh, running in the following order with uh, Professor Richard Falk first, uh, followed by uh, Catherine Gallagher, followed by uh, Rashid Khalidi, uh, uh, followed by Hala Khouri Bisharat, and then uh, at the end by uh, Kamil Mansour. Um, I'd like to start uh, this with a, a reading, if I may, of what the ICC prosecutor, um, in short, uh, what the ICC prosecutor um, her exact statement, which runs as follows. On February 20, 5th of February, 2021, the chamber decided by a majority that the court may exercise its criminal jurisdiction on the situation in Palestine and that the territorial scope of this jurisdiction extends to Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. In its majority ruling, the chamber stressed that it was not determining whether Palestine fulfilled the requirements of statehood under public international law or adjudicating a border dispute or prejudging the question of any future borders. It was solely determining the scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction for the purposes of the Rome Statute as requested. Such matters which the chamber did not decide and on which my office took no position remain to be, determined, to be determined in bilateral negotiations between the Israeli and Palestinian authorities in the context of a negotiated agreement. Having assessed submissions from states, international organizations and other stakeholders, the chamber was otherwise unanimous in its view that Palestine is a state party to the Rome Statute. The majority also ruled that Palestine's referral of the situation obliged the office to open an investigation, the office having determined that there exists a reasonable basis to do so in accordance with the Rome Statute. As, uh, uh, as I have previously mentioned, our first speaker on this issue uh, to see us through the legal and political implications is uh, Professor Richard Falk, who is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of International Law at Princeton University, Chair of, the Global, Law, Chair of Global Law at Queen Mary's London University. Um, he has lectured extensively on legal issues and was a member of the Independent Commission on Kosovo and of course, Special UN Rapporteur on Human Rights in Palestine uh, between 2008, 2014. Uh, we're going to give around 10 minutes for each speaker uh, then um, we will have at the end, after all speakers have uh, had their say, we will have a question and answers uh, session. This is in order for the uh, viewers to be able to decide to whom to direct their questions. Uh, we will try and end in about an hour, an hour and a half uh, with a, po a possible run over if necessary. So without further ado, please, Professor Falk. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, panel on this uh, really quite historic decision of the International Criminal Court. It's an unusual decision because from a strictly legal point of view, if Israel was not uh, the target of the decision, it would be treated as rather routine. The uh, two questions which uh, you read in, as uh, part of the prosecutor's announcement, uh, namely that uh, Palestine as a party to the, to the Rome Statute was entitled to have access to the international court and was for that purpose and only that purpose as state and that by the Rome Statute again, once there is evidence uh, to provide a reasonable grounds for crimes having been committed on the territory of a party uh, to the statute, then the court has the obligation to investigate the 
whether there exists a basis for uh, prosecution and potential uh, punishment. Uh, but because uh, of the nature of the defendant, this rather routine uh, decision from a jurisprudential point of view takes on momentous uh, proportions. And it's, it's really uh, so significant, I think, for a series of reasons. First of all, because it uh, is a it is the first time that the International Court of Ju International Criminal Court, since it was established, has shown the institutional courage to investigate the crimes of a leading state that's associated with the West and uh, has the geopolitical patronage of the United States and, to some extent, uh, the European. Uh, union. That institutional courage was lacking and had, in, in, to a significant degree, undermined the legitimacy of the institutions, because it was seen as an institution that was focused on what uh, Africans uh, leaders were doing that was uh, constituted international crimes. It wasn't that there wasn't the foundation for those indictments. It was that the uh, crimes of the countries in the North, that in many ways were more international and more serious, uh, were, were overlooked uh, for one reason or another. Uh, pr usually procedural reasons were given. But it, was, it created a, an important institutional backlash, which in effect said this is a, an imperial way of, in a post-colonial world, of uh, reestablishing the moral authority of the West over the rest of the world. And so to this, this uh, decision, even if it's only a preliminary decision to investigate, is a very dramatic refutation of that uh, institutional profile that had previously existed and is really important for that reason. But uh, a second uh, reason that I think makes this a momentous uh, decision is the uh, degree to which uh, law functions symbolically as well as substantively. And it is uh, particularly formidable in this regard with respect to Israel, because Israel adopts a kind of schizophrenic attitude toward international law. On the one side, having a almost unsurpassed record of defying international law on such uh, in the context of international humanitarian law, the establishment of the settlements, and uh, the way in which they've uh, annexed Jerusalem and uh, the Golan Heights and other uh, uh, defied the International Court of Justice with respect to the separation wall, a whole series of important actions in defiance of international law. At the same time, they are, uh, the Israeli government is exceedingly sensitive about being criticized from a normative perspective, either legally or morally. And they, uh, in this instance and in other instances, they don't have the substantive grounds to really refute the, uh, the legal uh, allegations. So they, re they have recourse to uh, so secondary means, which were uh, expressed, for instance, by Netanyahu, Netanyahu's uh, conclusion uh, that this was pure anti-Semitism. Nothing to do with the decision. Not, it didn't 
make any effort to say, to show that the jurisprudential grounds for finding a basis for investigation were incorrect. And beyond that, the US supported Israel by saying this demonstrated that the uh, International Criminal Court had been politicized. In truth, it had previously been politicized when it exempted states like Israel and the US that were guilty of crime after crime and yet were never uh, prosecuted, never even investigated very seriously. So this, in a sense, was a, uh, a very important way of uh, advancing the Palestinian struggle on, in the domain of symbolic politics. Because uh, we've seen in the last 75 years, ever since World War II, really, uh, that the uh, side that that prevails politically in uh, struggles for the control and legitimacy of the state is, has almost always been the side that prevails in what I call the legitimacy war, the, the war conducted in the symbolic domain. All the anti-colonial wars uh, were won by the weaker side militarily. And it was uh, the unlearned lesson for the United States was the failure to realize that despite its complete dominance militarily of the battlefield in Vietnam, it lost the war. See, and why these uh, militarily dominant actors lose these conflicts is one of the very important uh, changes in the way power is deployed in the 21st century and also in the latter part of the 20th century. And so this decision had an immense, has an immense relevance in the domain of symbolic politics and symbolic politics are extremely influential uh, at the level of civil society and international public opinion. It, it reinforces the uh, reasonableness of the BDS campaign, for just to give a, a, a one rather uh, concrete example. And it, it really unsettles the, uh, the, the rationalizations uh, for not uh, exerting pressure on Israel. It even uh, makes, uh, it moves the, is the Palestinian struggle closer to the latter stages of the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, where it was not the states that made the difference. It was the combination of resistance internally and global solidarity that changed the balance of power sufficiently that the South African elite recalculated. They didn't have a moral awakening. They recalculated their interests and decided they'd be better off in a multi, uh, uh, in a multi-racial constitutional democracy than they would by uh, maintaining an apartheid regime. And so that, that, that has uh, uh, great importance in my, that's what gives this uh, decision, even if nothing else happens, uh, historic significance. And then the third level that I would mention is the geopolitical uh, reaction uh, to uh, a decision that confronts uh, a Western-oriented country and a geopolitical leader like the U.S. in such a direct way. And uh, if one remembers, when the U.S. was faced a few months ago with a similar threat of investigation during the Trump presidency, it imposed 
sanctions on the prosecutor, an almost surrealistic uh, response uh, to a professional inquiry by a constituted international institution. So here, it's not clear how this geopolitical pushback will be managed and whether it is backroom pressure on the new prosecutor or uh, other forms of uh, defunding indirectly influencing some of the funding sources. Uh, neither US nor Israel are parties to the Rome statute. And uh, that gives them uh, no direct leverage. But we know from the way in which international institutions operate that the indirect leverage can be very, uh, uh, very potent in many situations. So it will be important to see how the geopolitical uh, aftermath of this historic pre-trial uh, pr or preliminary uh, decision by the ICC uh, chamber uh, is handled. And I would say that even if there is no effective geopolitical uh, pushback, it is still highly unlikely that the logistical problems of uh, handling a defiant Israel that almost certainly won't cooperate, how one uh, builds a case and gets access to the potential defendants, remembering the ICC is dealing with individuals, not with states, uh, and therefore it has to have some way of obtaining personal jurisdiction over those that are accused of international crime, and it has to gather the sufficient evidence to overcome the presumptions of innocence that are attached in a prosecution of this uh, character. And so uh, I think one has a lot of uncertainties in the road ahead, but we shouldn't lose uh, the appreciation of the historic importance that has already been achieved by this ICC decision, which if it does nothing else, establishes the credibility of allegations of international crimes by Israel on occupied, in occupied Palestine. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Falk. Uh, now uh, 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 we're going to turn to Catherine Gallagher, um, maybe with a view to uh, what this, uh, what uh, Professor Falk has called the symbolic politics of this, whether this actually uh, makes any difference from the victim's point of view. Well. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to fellow panelists and, and the audience, and just a, a deep appreciation to the Institute for Palestine Studies for inviting me to participate today. Um, my role in the quote unquote situation of Palestine, um, which is the formal title for this case before the International Criminal Court at this stage, is as a legal representative for victims. Um, I'm going to get into um, some of the reasons why they are seeking justice at the ICC in a moment. But I just want to start by, uh, by building off of a couple of the points that Professor Falk already made um, about the decision that was released on, in February by the pretrial chamber and then the decision by the prosecutor to formally open an investigation less than two weeks ago into crimes committed on the territory of the state of Palestine. Um, when she announced that she was opening an investigation, the prosecutor urged that there be a some measure of reason and balance in terms of the response because of that geopolitical um, 
condemnation that came, I should note, from only a few corners. Powerful though they may be, it was not um, from around the world. The International Criminal Court has 123 member states. The United States and Israel are not members, as aren't um, Burma, Myanmar, as isn't Russia. And I mentioned those countries because like Israeli nationals, the nationals of the United States, Russia, Myanmar, also find themselves potentially coming before the ICC in current proceedings. Um, this current prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, who remains under sanctions by the United States today under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, um, she has initiated either preliminary examinations or investigations into crimes committed on the territory of Georgia, the state of Georgia, the country of Georgia, I mean by that state, um, on the territory of Ukraine. And this includes related to the occupation of Crimea. And she is looking at the situation of the Rohingya because of their forced deportation from Myanmar into Bangladesh. So these are, which is a state party to the ICC. The United States citizens are being investigated because of their role in the global torture program uh, during the George W. Bush years. And they committed crimes, they are alleged to have committed crimes on the territory of Afghanistan, a state party, as well as at least on the territory of Romania, Lithuania, and Poland. And I would note that they also engaged in proxy detention in other member states, including Djibouti and Jordan. So what we see here in the situation of Palestine is not an unprecedented exercise of the court's jurisdiction over non-nationals of the ICC um, member states. When the Rome Statute was negotiated back in 1998, the United States and Israel both objected to the court being able to exercise jurisdiction over non-nationals. Um, it lost that fight in 1998. And so for the last 20 odd years, both Israel and the United States have been on notice that if their nationals commit war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, I think we need to remember what we're talking about here, the most serious crimes. If they commit those crimes on the territory of an ICC member state, they could come before the ICC. So what we saw on February 5th, while historic, and I would note also historic because of its affirmation of Palestinians' right to self-determination um, in having a state of Palestine and going to the ICC. Um, so while, while um, that is a, a significant step forward, it is not outside the bounds of the Rome Statute, nor is it outside the bounds of practice by the prosecutor. Um, so that was just a, a, an opening comment I wanted to make. Um, and also just in terms of that executive order by uh, Donald Trump against ICC officials and the resulting sanctions in the against the prosecutor and her senior staffer, those are still under quote unquote review by the Biden administration. So as we have the United States returning to the UN Human Rights Council this week for the Universal Periodic Review, it still has on the books an executive order that not only can um, sanction individuals, including victims, including lawyers, including Palestinian civil society for supporting investigations at the International Criminal Court. It also can provide civil and criminal penalties against any of anyone, including US citizens, who support those investigations. So this is a, a pretty serious situation that still exists under an America's back human rights priority um, Biden administration. So I hope that we can see that change very, very soon. It's the fact that it, that executive order and the sanctions are still in the books is a deep cause of concern. And frankly, in my opinion, a dent um, on the administration. Uh, but I think we'll hear a lot more from that as the conversation continues. Um, so why and how is it that this case is at the ICC? As I mentioned, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. 
War crimes can occur in the situation of a, an occupation like we have in Palestine, and crimes against humanity are widespread or systematic attacks against a civilian population. And what we, many of us have seen for decades is that there has been the commission of both war crimes and crimes against humanity um, against Palestinian civilians in the occupied Palestinian territory. This is a very, very well-documented series of crimes documented by the United Nations, included in Security Council resolutions. Um, it, we have commissions of inquiry, fact-finding missions. We have excellent work done by um, human rights organizations in real time, whether Palestinian, whether international, or whether Israeli. So in terms of a crime base here, we know that there are crimes that have been committed. What we also know, unfortunately, is that there has been both impunity and reoccurrence of those crimes decade after decade after decade. The ICC is a court of last resort. Victims can only turn to the ICC when there isn't another forum, when countries are either unwilling or unable to um, provide justice. And in the case of for Palestinians and of Palestine, there is no other forum. We've seen Palestinians seek justice um, before Israeli courts, before foreign national courts under universal jurisdiction, as Professor Falk mentioned, um, at the International Court of Justice, and there has been no real accountability. What the individuals who I represent in the proceedings, um, we had the opportunity to make submissions on this question of whether the court can exercise jurisdiction. The victims I represent are a, a cross-section of Palestinians. Um, they are bringing forward claims in cases that run from the time that the ICC can exercise jurisdiction, which is 13 June 2014. So right before that, the Gaza assault of, of the summer of 2014, which remarkably is now almost seven years ago and there has still been no real meaningful accountability for any of the victims there. So the individuals I represent are individuals um, who were harmed in the harmed or killed or had family members killed in 2014 in the assault. They are individuals who from Gaza again, um, who were killed or injured in relation to the Great March of Return in 2018. Um, one of the individuals who I represent was denied an exit permit to seek medical care after being shot by a sniper in the Great March of Return while exercising the right to, to protest and so had a leg amputated. Another individual whose family I represent was also denied a, um, an exit permit to get medical care and died from his wounds. Um, I represent Palestinians in the diaspora who are denied access back to the territory of Palestine and in so being denied are denied their right to family or denied their right to religion um, or denied denied their, their right to self-determination. I represent individuals who um, have been accepted into educational institutions in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and because they are in Gaza, they are not allowed to travel and take up those educational opportunities and professional um, opportunities to improve their professional skill set. And so that is a denial of the right to education education, a denial of the right to freedom of movement. Um, there is a, one of my, the individuals I represent has a, a spouse in the West Bank. He traveled back to Gaza when his mother was dying, and now he cannot get back to the West Bank to be with his wife. So again, denial of the right to family. Um, there, these fundamental rights that Palestinians are denied on a daily basis, because of, of the restrictions placed by Israel on their movement, on their livelihoods, on their family relationships, frankly, on their right to life. Um, these are fundamental rights that 
underlie the crime against humanity of persecution. So we are urging that the prosecutor in her investigation prioritize the framing of crime against humanity of persecution, which can get at so many of the harms against Palestinians um, in Gaza, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, as well as in the diaspora. This is one of the priority cases. Another, of course, is the settlement enterprise. Um, and there are there already have been a number of submissions put forward by victims back in this kind of technical phase of, of jurisdiction. And I think now that the investigation is open, we are going to see um, Palestinians come, come forward and seek to engage in this process and exercise their right to access justice. Um, I think we will see organizations um, like Palestinian Center for Human Rights, El Mizan and, and El Haq, which have been very active in this, again, um, engage with the ICC. I think we'll see Defense for Children International Palestine, which has already put in a submission on behalf of the children victims, the child victims, whether in detention, or let's remember in that 2014 assault, over 500 of the civilian victims were children. Um, there is also a submission by Palestinian political prisoners. So these are the crimes that thus far have had no accountability and because of the impunity are continuing. Um, and this is why it is that Palestinians have turned to this court of last resort and will continue to engage with it um, in, the, in the hopes of achieving some measure of justice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, highlighting uh, both the extraordinary silence of the Biden administration on, on the Trump sanctions and of course the plight of the, the victims which you are uh, so thankfully from our point of view defending. Um, now uh, we're going to look at uh, possibly uh, carry on from, from what you've just uh, reminded us of in terms of what the US policy might be. Um, Rashid, if you'd like to pick up from there, please. Sure, thanks. Um, I'll be talking about the uh, political implications for the United States and, and how the United States is likely to respond. Um, and I'll pick up from what Catherine uh, already said, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some possible international implications as well. Um, as, as exactly as, as Catherine Gallagher said, the US position under the Biden administration remains almost exactly where it was under the Trump administration. And I'm gonna quote from um, testimony of Secretary of State Tony Blinken before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday, uh, March 9th, where he reiterated the administration's opposition to the ICC prosecutor's decision to open a formal investigation into war, war crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories. I'm going to quote Blinken now, and I want to take up a couple of the points he makes. Blinken said, this is on Wednesday last, it's been our view and remains our view that jurisdiction is reserved when a state consents to it or if there's a referral by the United Nations Security Council. Neither is true in the case of Israel and the Palestinian matter. He doesn't say Palestine or the Palestinian territories, the Palestinian matter. And this is a key phrase. This is again, Blinken last Wednesday. We have the capacity ourselves to provide accountability when those issues arise and we, will make, and we will continue to make clear our opposition. He went on to clarify that the administration is still reviewing, exactly as Catherine said, the sanctions placed by the Trump administration, uh, Trump administration on ICC prosecutor uh, Abdul Ben Souda. Um, I'm gonna come back to that point. Of, well, let me, let me talk a little bit about that statement of, of Blinken's and I'm gonna go, come back to Blinken in a minute. Um, he said, we have the capacity ourselves to provide, provide accountability when those issues arise. This is actually quite an extraordinary statement. Um, it's the imperial we. It is a case of the United States arrogating to itself the role of an international arbiter. The United States, in other words, is the one that determines uh, issues of accountability. And this is being said by an, uh, 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 the Secretary of State of an administration 
in a long line of administrations, none of which have provided any form of accountability for any action of Israel over many, many decades. So essentially what is being said, uh, and I'll come back to, 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 to Blinken's statements because he's, he said things that make clear what this really means. What he is saying is nobody else has the right to hold Israel accountable. We are the only ones who can do it and unspoken, we won't. Um, and I think that very much sums up the, um, I think that very, very much sums up uh, the uh, American position. Earlier, uh, a few days earlier, I think soon after the uh, decision was announced that the uh, investigation would be launched, Blinken said uh, very explicitly that the ICC has no jurisdiction as Israel is not a party to the ICC. Although the investigation does not relate to Israel and its territories, let's say is Israel proper, it relates to the occupied Palestinian territories. Nevertheless, he said, Israel is not a party to the ICC, has not consented. And he said, quote, the US has serious concerns about ICC attempts to exert its jurisdiction over Israeli personnel. So what he's talking about is not Israel doing something inside Israel's own sovereign territory. What he's talking about is what Israeli personnel might be doing across the green line in the occupied Palestinian territories. He continued, this is again Blinken in an earlier statement, Palestinians do not qualify as a sovereign state and are not qualified to obtain membership as a state in participation as a state in or to delegate jurisdiction to the ICC. And he ended that statement by saying, the United States will continue to uphold our strong commitment to Israel's security, including by opposing uh, 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 actions that seek uh, to, to single out Israel unfairly. Now, I think that the, the, the key here is the term, uh, our strong commitment to Israel's security. An American commitment to Israel's security has nothing to do with the security of Israel's citizens in most cases. In most cases, it has to do with an American commitment to shield Israel from accountability for actions that it takes uh, as far afield as uh, the, the eight Arab capitals that Israel has bombed over the last several decades, in many cases using American weapons in violation of the very clear American laws on transfers of equipment, which can only, uh, military equipment, which can only be used for security, for, sorry, for self-defense. Um, so what essentially Biden is saying is that the litmus test for the American position will be whether something uh, 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 falls within this broad, capacious category of Israel's security, which basically covers anything Israel does anywhere, anytime. Anything Israel does is justified as, as, as uh, in terms of Israel's security, is therefore self-defense, and therefore use of American weapons in these uh, military actions is not a violation of US law. Um, so that is the US position. Um, and I would argue that it's anchored in two considerations. Most people assume that the main or even the only consideration for this position uh, on the ICC and for other American positions having to do with Israeli violations of international law, uh, possible war crimes, uh, and other, other uh, human rights violations is the longstanding commitment of American administrations going back for many, many decades to defend Israel in any and all international instances, in any and all international forums where it's been subject to criticism. And I, 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 I'm not disputing that this is undoubtedly a consideration here and in every other case. I would argue, however, that in this case, the reference to Israeli personnel should give us a clue as to the second consideration for American opposition uh, to this uh, action of the ICC. And that is a concern that US personnel might be brought before the ICC for violations. Because exactly as Catherine said, neither Israel nor uh, the United States are parties uh, to, this, uh, to, the, to, to the ICC convention. Um, but I think what, what is a concern for the American defense establishment the American security managers, for American politicians, is that American personnel in situations in third countries or in, in, in gray zones, like the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, may be brought before the ICC. 
uh, for similar violations of, uh, of international law, war crimes, and so forth. I think it's really notable um, in Blinken's statement of, of the 9th of March to the House Foreign Affairs Committee um, that he pointed his, out his serious concerns over ICC jurisdiction over Israeli personnel, not inside Israel, but in the OPT, in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, for the United States, which has military personnel engaged in combat in dozens of war zones worldwide, I think this is a concern, uh, a precedential concern, i.e. it is a concern about the precedent that might be set, set by an ICC prosecution um, in a gray zone like the occupied Palestinian territories where Israeli personnel are, are being charged with war crimes or with other violations uh, under uh, by the ICC. I would suggest that this position is unlikely to change. This administration, I doubt, will change this. They may or may not drop their sanctions against Fatou Ben Souda, against the prosecutor or her staff. Uh, they may or may not uh, continue to harass the ICC. But I think that uh, this uh, position will not change. I think that, in fact, it may be amped up. I think that we will probably be seeing uh, a, a translation of this position into pressure on the current prosecutor's successor when she steps down, as she is supposed to at the end of her term, um, in order to pressure the new prosecutor, whoever that is, she or he is, to close this investigation. And as is often the case, we can read in news coming out of Israel what the United States is going to do. And Israeli reports have suggested that the United States uh, uh, should be and will be pressuring um, the successor to Fatou Ben Souda, to the current uh, prosecutor when her term ends, to simply close the investigation. The Israelis have helpfully laid out for the United States the argument that uh, no prosecutor is obliged to carry on with a prosecution launched uh, by her or his predecessor. Um, let me say one other quick thing about the United States, which is that for the first time in American history, I think, there is not just a single or a lone or a pair of legislators who are critical of US policy in Palestine. For the first time since Woodrow Wilson, there is a group of legislators, 24 of them, for example, in the House, uh, in the last session of the House, who signed on to Betty McCollum's bill as co-sponsors uh, to uh, prohibit Israel from detention of minors. It's a, it's a bill that will probably be reintroduced in this session. Um, and more recently, a dozen members of Congress, in fact, yesterday, uh, sorry, on the 13th uh, uh, of March, uh, called, on, uh, called on the, uh, uh, sent a letter to Tony Blinken, to the Secretary of State, calling on the administration to do several things, to oppose Israeli annexation of occupied Palestinian lands, to condemn Israeli demolition of pa Palestinian homes, and to officially rescind the Trump administration's so-called peace to prosperity plan. Um, we have not had that kind of a block in Congress ever before, uh, which session after session, year after year, has been willing to critique uh, American policy on Palestine, as it were, from the left, from a progressive position. I'm not suggesting that that is a powerful block that will force the administration to do anything, but it is the first time that they're coming under criticism. Um, I don't know if they're going to take up the ICC matter. Um, however, the language of the letter that they sent to Blinken is quite extraordinary. They talk about colonization of the occupied territories. The language is really quite extraordinary and quite interesting. I don't want to read from it because we want to talk about the ICC. I just want to point out that although I'm, 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 I'm fairly sure that the administration will continue with this position on the ICC, not only because of its solicitude for Israel's welfare, i.e. It's, it's, it's continued interest in shielding Israel from any accountability for its actions in the occupied territories, uh, but also because I think this, this, this is, is a matter that is seen as a, a, an American interest insofar as American personnel might be brought before the tribunal for the same reasons. Let me say a few words in conclusion about the international implications. Um, I think we are likely to see major US allies, certainly like the United Kingdom, and possibly France and others, uh, which also have forces committed in, war, in combat, in war zones, together with uh, the United States, alongside the United States, war zones like Afghanistan, 
for example, or Iraq or elsewhere. I think we are likely to see these major US allies uh, uh, come under uh, strong pressure from the United States to adhere uh, to the US position. They may or may not knuckle under to that pressure, but I am positive that there are back channels, even as we speak, between the United States and every major ally that has combat forces committed alongside the United States in war zones, like, as I've said, Afghanistan and Iraq or West Africa or other places um, where combat is ongoing uh, in order to, to, for them to uh, adopt the American position. And I think this is irrespective of their positions on Palestine. I think it will be, it'll be, it'll be put by the United States in terms of self-interest. This is a dangerous precedent. British troops uh, could be brought uh, before the ICC. And, and Britain, I think, and some of these European countries are signatories uh, to the ICC convention. So it, it, they are in a different position than the United States is. Um, the United States is worried about personnel in gray areas uh, where there's no sovereign state or there's no clear decision on sovereignty like the occupied Palestinian territories um, being brought before the court. Um, for these, these European uh, allies, in particular European allies of the United States, uh, there's another consideration since they themselves are signatories to this convention. Um, I think the reaction of other international actors uh, will be similar to their reaction on the issue of Palestine going right back to the partition decision of 1947. Uh, they will have to balance between whatever their position might be on Palestine and on Israeli violations of international law. And on the other hand, their willingness or their ability to stand up to US and or Israeli bullying. Um, if one goes back and looks at the partition resolution, the countries that voted for it back in 1947, many of them were bullied, arm twisted, forced, um, many, in, in particular, many Latin American countries uh, into voting alongside the United States uh, uh, for a position in Palestine, which they previously had not held for partition of Palestine, the creation of a Jewish state in most of a country which had an Arab majority. And in the decades since then, the United States has used the same kind of bullying tactics to attempt uh, to obtain support for its support for Israel. It ha often hasn't worked in the General Assembly, but in a case like, like this, where countries are not called upon to, to, to take a public position, uh, I am sure there will be pressure from the United States, particularly on allies, uh, but also on third parties. So in conclusion, um, I unfortunately do not think that the United States is likely to change the position of the Trump administration uh, on this issue, as in, unfortunately, so many other key areas uh, relating to Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, it's striking, I think, that the EU as a collective has come out in support uh, of the ICC decision, although some EU state members have dissented, uh, Austria, Germany, amongst others. Um, so we're likely to see, I think, a, a, some kind of division within the EU uh, on this. I, I don't know how far uh, the uh, common position will be sustained, but I think that will be a very important dimension of this if you have a clear uh, split between the United States on the one hand uh, and the e EU on the other. Um, uh, well, let's uh, we'll leave that to the perhaps to the question and answer session. Uh, now we go on to uh, Dr. Hala uh, Khurib Sharat uh, from Haifa, who's going to give us uh, uh, an insight into how the Israelis have reacted and how they may react in the future. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for the Institute of Palestine Studies that invited me to speak on this uh, webinar. Uh, in my uh, talk today, I would like to address. Uh, the Israeli Attorney General Memorandum that was published as a reaction of the prosecutor of the ICC when it approached the pre-trial uh, pre chamber asking them, requesting them to, uh, to rule on the course jurisdiction on the situation in Palestine. So an hours before the request was made public, the request of the ICC prosecutor on the 19th of December, uh, on the 20th of December, sorry, 2019, the Israeli Attorney General uh, publishes a, a memorandum which state the position of the uh, State of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the jurisdiction, trying to challenge the court 
uh, jurisdiction on the so-called situation in Palestine. So I think uh, that this memorandum was not discussed publicly and uh, uh, legally in the public and academic sphere enough. And we should, it's very important for us to tackle it and, and read through it because we, we, we get to understand the shift in the Israeli rhetoric, yes, the legal rhetoric. Uh, what I'm saying that if we look at Israel's strategy towards the case, then the advisory opinion on the separation of the wall, we saw that the Israeli government did not cooperate, did not even react, did not publish anything, any legal document, because that was an advisory opinion, but we see here a, a different strategy and the state of Israel finds the way to publish its legal position on the issue of jurisdiction. Because so there's a shift or we can see that we're talking about an international criminal court, which is different. And what is in prospect here, what is awaiting Israelis might be arrest warrants, criminal investigation, and the Attorney General of Israel cannot afford himself not to publish a legal position on the issue of jurisdiction. And also, I think it's part of, of, of uh, 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 the, uh, telling the court we are going to be in for the complementarity issue. So Israel is already stating, yes, we are uh, reacting to the court's jurisdiction, and it is very important for us. So this uh, uh, actually uh, attaches to what Professor Falk says about the schizophrenic uh, nature of the Israeli uh, uh, position. So if we look at this memorandum, yes, we see actually in this memorandum, the attorney general uh, uh, is focused on the issue of state sovereignty, yes? The memorandum, the memorandum does not pertain to any issues relating to Palestinian population. It does not even try to challenge the prima facie uh, uh, war, uh, war crimes allegations against Israelis. Yes, it does not. The whole concentration, the main concentration of the Israeli memorandum is on Israel sovereignty. Yes, on the issue of sovereignty. And if we really look deep into the wording of this memorandum, we see that the conception the, of sovereignty inside this memorandum is very outdated, yes, conception or understanding of state sovereignty. We see the adoption in the memorandum of the Israeli extreme right wing position. I, I, the attorney general is saying actually that Israel is the sovereign a power state over all the territories occupied in 1967. Yes, he doesn't even say occupied. It says it is under Israeli sovereignty. Israel has claims of sovereignty over these territories. They look at these territories, the occupied territories, as part of the historic, yes, Israel, yes, Eretz Israel. It's part of the uh, uh, land of the Jewish people the indigenous right of the Jewish people to this land, and they see 1967's war as a just war. So according to the memorandum of the attorney general, yes, this memorandum, there is no, the, the, the territories are not occupied. We're not talking about belligerent occupation. We're talking about this is under the sovereignty of, of, of Israel. So, uh, the future, so Israel, what is claiming here, the Attorney General, that all what pertains to these territories, it is our, yes, under our jurisdiction, it is our, under our effective control. So everything got to do with the future, political future of these territories is, is ours to say, negotiations, consent, it is for us to uh, determine the future of these territories. And what is doing now, what is the ICC doing? It's a political intervention. Yes, what is the ICC doing is political and uh, uh, it violates the political will of the state of Israel. This is what the attorney general trying to do when challenging the jurisdiction of the court. But it's very interesting uh, to see that the 
attorney's general conception of sovereignty here is reflects a notion of sovereignty that really outdated. It's a, it's a conception that was uh, uh, accepted even before the Second World War, yes? The principle of non-intervention in, in the, yes, non-intervention in states exercise of power over its nationals or everybody who is under its control. This was a very outdated it's an outdated conception because human rights, international human rights law does, is not concerned with the old formalistic understanding of sovereignty and states' rights, but rather follows a functional approach that examines how a state exercises its power over the population living within its jurisdiction under its effective control. So, what we see in the memorandum, his assertions are rather radical, the assertions of the attorney general and are even in comparison with his opinions before the Supreme Israeli Supreme Court are contradictory. He deviates, the attorney general of Israel deviates from his position before the Supreme Court because before the Supreme Court, the, the, the position the, of the government, which he represents in the Supreme Court, is that this is a belligerent occupation in the occupied territories. It's a temporary occupation, yes, and IHL prevails in the area, but we see here a deviation, a contradiction from the official position of the state of Israel. And even if we look, very interesting. On the uh, late, uh, latest Israeli Supreme Court decision in June uh, 2020 relating to the regularization of the Israeli settlements, yes? Trying, there was a Israel enacted the law that tried to legalize the, the establishment of the settlements, the Israeli settlements and the confiscation of Palestinian private lands. Yes, so a, a, a case was brought before the Israeli Supreme Court to challenge the constitutionality of this law that trying to confiscate a, a private lands of Palestinians and legalize the, the establishment of settlements. So a, in his position here before the Supreme Court, imagine the attorney general, it was a very unique, exceptional attitude pertaining or saying that he would not represent the government of Israel in this issue because he sees, according to his opinion, that uh, uh, the areas, the, 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 the Palestinian occupied territories, according to my, yes, what I'm saying, in his view, it is a belligerent occupation prevailing over there and IHL prevails prevails and human rights is supplementary, international human rights supplementary to IHL. Meaning that he's not saying that Israel's sovereignty over these territories and what is the, did the Israeli government actually claim here that Israel has effective control on the area. Israeli parliament, yes, as the representative, the legal representative or the, the sovereign representative of the sovereign Jewish people in these uh, uh, territories, because the West Bank, according to the government, is part of Israel. So the parliament, the Israeli parliament is, has, yes, it has the power, is entitled to regulate such a law in these areas. The attorney general did not concede, did not accept this position, and he did not accept, he refused to represent the Israeli government on this issue. And the Israeli government was represented by a private lawyer in this case, yes? And, uh, and what we saw at the end of the line that the court, when it made, uh, give the decision in a, a eight to one, yes? that was a ruling deciding on an eight to one, annulling uh, the, this ruling to annul this law because, and the Supreme Court, Israeli Supreme Court expressed and stressed the idea 
the notion, the legal notion that we are talking about occupied territories, yes? And there's a belligerent occupation there, supplemented by international human rights law, which pertain to these areas, yes? And uh, a practical implication is that this law of the state of Israel, yes, does not apply in this region. So what we see now in the memorandum of the attorney general is a real contradiction of his position inside Israel before the Israeli Supreme Court. Yes, so, and the question, why does the attorney general does that? Well, we see a shift. It's a pure, clear shift in the Israeli rhetoric vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, international tribunals such as the ICC. And it's, it makes us even yes, think why Israel is doing that, yes? Why Israel is doing that when, when Israel, the Supreme Court of Israel says that there is no two legal systems, yes? Prevailing in the occupied territories because they don't wanna say there's an apartheid regime, yes, in the occupied territories. So the Israeli Supreme Court always kept the, 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 the position that we are talking about occupied territories that uh, has to be, you know, the future of which will be determined upon negotiations with both parties. And this memorandum, we see a deviation from the formalistic, from the formal, even from the Israeli Supreme Court position. And I would like to say if any, I think it's very important for us in order to understand Israel position is to read through this memorandum. And uh, you could go to uh, Adala's website and see uh, more getting into more details and cases showing demonstrating how the memorandum, the Attorney General Israel's memorandum is full of contradictions. Yes, vis-a-vis -vis his decisions and his positions before the Israeli Supreme Court. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very interesting to hear these contradictions. I'm wondering whether this actually opens the door for the ICC investigation to exploit the contradictions, and maybe that's something we can discuss. Um, Camille, please, um, on okay. the Palestinian uh, view and reactions. Yes, uh, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, I, would like, I would like to tackle three issues in my talk about the implications of the decision, of the chamber decision on the Palestinians. The three issues are, first, what it means for Palestine beyond or outside the criminal investigation. Second, the areas of the investigation. And third, fears and prospects. So what does it mean first for Palestine beyond or outside the criminal investigation? As we know, the pre-trial chamber has declared that the court territorial jurisdiction extends to the territories occupied by Israel since 1937 namely Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The chamber based itself on UN General Assembly resolutions and the advisory opinion of the ICJ concerning the legal consequences of the construction of the war in the occupied Palestinian territories. In its decision, the chamber referred approvingly 29 times to Palestinian rights of the, to self-determination, five times to Palestinian sovereignty, and eight times to human rights. In particular, the chamber referred explicitly to the provisions of the UNGA resolutions that affirm Palestinian sovereignty over the entirety of the Palestinian territories occupied by Israel in 1967. The chamber has even made reference to the Security Council Resolution 2334, adopted in December 2016, towards the end of the Obama administration. In particular, the chamber quoted the provision that called upon all states to distinguish between the territory of the state of Israel and the territories occupied 
since 1967. After making so many references to Palestinian statehood and to the territorial scope of the Palestinian state, one wonders why did the chamber feel the need to explain that this scope is valid only in so far as criminal investigation is concerned. Why did it add that it is neither adjudicating a border dispute under international law nor prejudging the question of any future borders? I would like here to minimize the legal significance of the chamber's reservation concerning the negotiability of Palestine borders. To justify its reservation, the chamber has made itself on two precedents, but these two precedents are not related to any dispute over the delimitation of borders between two states and consequently have, not, have no bearing at all on the Palestine situation. In the Palestine situation itself, we are dealing with the issue of jurisdiction within and not beyond the Palestine state borders. It is also useful to add the following. By adhering to the Rome Statute in January 2015 and referring alleged serious crimes to the ICC in May 2018, the Palestine state has delegated its sovereign competence in adjudicating these crimes to the ICC. If Palestine is sovereign enough to delegate to the ICC its jurisdiction in a central domain of, it pub of its public law, then it should also be recognized as sovereign in non-criminal areas of public law pertaining to the entirety, to the entirety of the territory such as the right to exercise its control to the limits of its borders. To conclude this part, this first part, I will say the following. The decision constitutes another building block in the series, in the series of building blocks that include UN resolutions, Palestine status as a member state, as a non-member state in the UN, and member of several international organizations and signatory of many international instruments. The chamber has revived the 1967 borders after the Trump administration attempt to erase it. And, it, and incidentally, the chamber has revived Security Council Resolution 2034, a resolution that was thought to be a mere four-week parenthesis whose effect would be lost as soon as the Trump administration would take office. This suggests that what appears as a useless statement of principles and norms at a certain moment could become useful later on. Now, my second part, areas of investigation. Some comment commentators have spoken about the possibility of the prosecutor not opening an investigation, especially that uh, Ben Souda will be replaced next June by a British lawyer, Karim Khan. However, one should recall that the Chamber stated in its, in its decision that the prosecutor is, in principle, obliged to initiate an investigation. The Chamber also added that, just, that such an investigation has, in principle, already been opened as a matter of law. As all we know, the prosecutor is expected to investigate three groups of cases. One group is related to alleged Israeli crimes, Israeli crimes during the Gaza war of 20, 2014 and during the Gaza Great March of Return in 2018. A second group is related to crimes pertaining to Israeli settlements in the West Bank including East Jerusalem. A third group concerns alleged crimes committed by Palestinians. I must stress here that Palestinians and their friends and their friends across the world should prepare for all three groups. Some, for instance, some people, for instance, have said 
Palestinians should focus mainly on the settlements. I don't agree with such a position, though it is true that evidence of such activity, of such settlement activities, is relatively easy to find, and that any ICC progress in, investiga in investigating them and prosecuting them could have a significant impact on Palestinian territoriality. For its part, Israel will fight, whether directly or indirectly, probably indirectly, on all three fronts. It will question the jurisdiction of the ICC over each of potential cases in groups one and two. It will argue that it, ha that it has a credible judicial system which has dealt and will continue to deal with aggrieved crimes committed by Israelis. And it will make sure that aggrieved victims of aggrieved Palestinian crimes will have their voice heard. In any case, from the Palestinian point of view, one should not minimize the profound need of the victims to seek accountability. Now, my third part, fears and prospects. In its search for accountability at the ICC, Palestine will not enjoy support neither from the great powers nor from the Arab states, only two of which have ratified the Rome Statute. ICC investigators and judges will be subject to intense pressure. Because of this pressure, procedures which normally take a long time will require still more time as a matter of precaution. Nobody knows how many months, how many years will be necessary to see tangible results. But along the tortuous road of investigation and possible prosecution and adjudication, well, diplomatic, political, and or economic pressure will be exercised on the PLO, the Palestinians, and those who support their cause. Many in the audience are probably familiar with the diplomatic pressure that, would, that was behind the PAO's failure to build on the 2404 ICJ advisory opinion on the wall. And behind also the pressure that was behind the PAO's erratic decision making the Goldstone report in 2009. Once again, the US may request, may demand expressions of Palestinian backpedaling as condition for the resumption of its financial support, the reopening of the US consulate in Jerusalem, or the reopening of the PAO office in Washington. This could be accompanied in the best of cases with obtaining some kind of quid pro quo from Israel, such as de-escalation of the settlement activities. Here, there is a real fear that the Palestinian leadership will succumb to pressure and satisfy itself with short-lived cramps. I have three fears in this regard. The first stems from the, present, from the present weakness of the Palestinian leadership and the divisions within the Palestinian polity. The second fear is based on the history of Palestinian performance in previous negotiations rounds, especially when it agreed to the idea of territorial swaps, i.e. to the idea of the negotiability of 1967 lines. My third fear originates from the non legalistic culture of the Palestinian leadership. Many Palestinian leaders faced with the US and Israeli behavior have developed over the years a, rea a realistic, even, even cynical approach to international relations and international law. 
for some of them going to the ICJ to ICC has been and is a superficial a superficially transactional instrumental matter. It belongs to Palestinian advocacy groups and human and human rights organizations to put on the Palestinian leadership a sustained effort of persuasion. Thank you. Finish. Thank you very much, Camille. And thanks for sounding all these uh, warning bells, which I share with you uh, personally. And I think it's very important to highlight them, particularly uh, as, re as regards to the fact that this investigation includes Hamas as well. Uh, and this is not something to be dismissed uh, lightly. Um, given the constraints of time, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm afraid, uh, with a host of questions, going to have to be a bit selective in what questions to, to ask. So I will try and choose questions that are directed to any particular uh, speaker. Um, to uh, Professor Falk, uh, given the crime of apartheid, uh, given the crime of apartheid is prescribed by the Rome Statute, could you address the possibility that the Office of the Prosecutor may find reasonable grounds to believe that Israel's engaged in the crime of apartheid on the territory of Palestine? Oh, you're, you're muted, Professor Falk. Uh, that's an important question uh, and a complicated one. There's, in my view, there's every reason to investigate the allegation of apartheid. Uh, the policies and practices of Israel uh, toward the occupied Palestinian people, particularly in contrast with the treatment of the Jewish settlers, uh, creates a prima facie case of apartheid that would be very hard to oppose from any reasonable point of view. At the same time, if uh, the notion of apartheid, which is listed as a crime against humanity in the Rome Statute, follows the uh, kind of rules of evidence that the International Court of Justice followed in relation to Bosnia, it would be extremely difficult to satisfy uh, the evidentiary requirements and to situate uh, responsibility uh, on uh, a leader unless one could show an intentionality uh, bearing on uh, apartheid. In other words, uh, it was very clear that in the Bosnian case, for instance, that they required a showing that uh, Serbia intended uh, the uh, ethnic uh, destruction of the uh, Bosnian Muslim population. And they couldn't, uh, they didn't uh, uh, satisfy that uh, standard. They did hold uh, Serbia responsible for the Srebrenica uh, massacre because that was something that was sufficiently uh, de demonstrable as an intended genocidal act. On the other hand, the International Court of Justice proceeds against states, not individuals. And so there would be an extra difficulty in the ICC context of uh, pinning criminal responsibility on the military and political leadership of Israel. So I, my sense is that the uh, ICC has enough on its plate that it won't tackle apartheid at this time. I mean, that it, it's too big an issue for it to uh, undertake the political atmospherics that we've been discussing. 
Thank you, Professor Paul. Um, I, <coughs> sorry, um, there's two, que uh, two questions which I'll um, lump together um, for Catherine and Camille. Um, if and when the Palestinians bring cases to the ICC against Israelis, how can the Palestinians be protected from Israeli retaliatory actions? And the second question, which is also to Catherine, trials in absentia are not supported at the ICC. What legal basis and what possibilities are there for any trial to start before the ICC if any to be indicted Israeli suspect is not in custody in the court? Okay, I'll go quickly and then and then um, hand it over to Camille. Um, you know, on that first question, it's a very serious one. Um, I, I have my victim participation filing here. And if you can see, the names of the victims are redacted. Um, I had a number of victims who actually wanted their name on ICC, um, you know, with the ICC seal and before the court in The Hague. And it was decided by um, the ICC that at this stage they could not provide proper um, protection for, for victims. So there is a victim and witness unit that can do so. And, and we hope that it will be um, following these proceedings very carefully. Um, but the executive order in and of itself is a threat to victims. It's a, a threat to them for legal consequences. And it, it gives some kind of validation to the threats that we're now seeing, including on Twitter against the prosecutor and those in Palestinian civil society, including victims who are supporting this investigation. So this sort of gets into a, the answer to the second question which is how can cases actually proceed against Israeli officials? And this is where the 123 member states of the ICC need to be clear and need to be strong in their commitment to the, the mission of the International Criminal Court, which is to end impunity and hold those who bear responsibility for the greatest, uh, the greatest responsibility for the most serious crimes to account. And now that we are in the investigative stage, all 123 member states, including the UK, including Canada, including Germany, countries that may have not been so supportive in theory of this investigation are now obligated under the statute to cooperate with the court. And so whether that's in the case of eventual arrest warrants or even in terms of sharing information now, um, and hopefully also, when we get back to the point of soft power, when it comes to the budget, actually ensuring that there are resources for the court to conduct an investigation and for victims to be, um, to be protected. And I think we'll be seeing the first test of this when what many are expecting might happen, which is a Security Council deferral request. And that is a place where the US will wield its very mighty power. And um, as I mentioned, the, the Russians are, are also in the crosshairs of the ICC with Ukraine and Georgia. So, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of activity actually in New York rather than The Hague um, as the next focal point. And I hope again that the 123 member states, including France and uh, the UK, stand true to equal access to justice and to the, the principles and promise of the International Criminal Court. Thank you. Camille, do you have any comments? Yes, there is a problem concerning protection. Yeah. In fact, if you read the Goldstone report of 2009, there was already in the report a concern for people who uh, gave testimonies outside the West Bank and Gaza because, you know, it, uh, it was forbidden, I mean, for the Goldstone mem uh, committee members to come to Palestine and Israel. So, uh, and, uh, and probably today, there is a relative possibility for people in Gaza to testify with a, with a minimum uh, you know, uh, risk relatively, I mean, if we relatively to West, the West Bank, including Jerusalem, where there is no possibility of protection at all because Israel can uh, reach you know, each, <laughs> each village, each quarter, each house and search the per and take the person. In, the, in, the, in, uh, in Gaza, short of uh, targeting killing, I mean, 
short of this, people are somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat protected, but they cannot travel, they will not be able to travel, they will not be able to go and back, uh, you know, that's, that's a big problem. Thank you, Camille. Uh, Rashid is, uh, has only limited time, so uh, I'm going to pose a question to him before we turn to a number of other questions. Um, has the new US uh, has the new US administration renounced former Secretary of State Pompeo's statement that international humanitarian law does not apply in the occupied territories, thereby legitimizing legal settlements? Uh, does does the do you think that the the Biden administration is going to take a stand that reverses the Trump administration's position on settlements? And how would you think this is relevant in terms of the ICC? Um, investigation. Well, the Biden administration has been very, has been quite proactive uh, domestically in very early on in its tenure reversing important Trump administration positions. Uh, on Palestine, it has not done so. Um, in spite of a number of campaign pledges, in spite of things that uh, 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 Tony Blinken himself said uh, before the election. Um, they have not yet actually reversed uh, any, as far as I know, of the quite significant positions taken by the um, Trump administration on, for example, uh, Israel's annexation of uh, Arab East Jerusalem on, for example, the issue of the illegality or illegality of settlements on the issue of uh, Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights on, for example, the uh, endorsement given by the Trump administration uh, in the plan of the century to Israel's potential annexation of large areas of the West Bank. So on those major significant issues with legal uh, uh, import, uh, the uh, new administration so far has done nothing uh, to reverse any of these positions. Um, I think it's actually striking that Blinken has specifically come out and basically endorsed the Trump uh, administration position on the ICC. And I think that might be a harbinger of where we're going uh, on these issues. Um, as a very acute foreign policy observer, Peter Beinart uh, wrote this morning, uh, whereas the Trump administration has moved quite a bit to the left in terms of domestic policy, uh, where its critics uh, to the left are the ones that they're listening to. Uh, in foreign policy, it seems to only be listening to its critics from the right. Uh, I think that the, the Secretary of State's performance before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate House, uh, sorry, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, uh, is an indication of the degree to which he is kowtowing to Republican critics and to conservative war hawk Democratic critics uh, on a broad, broad range of foreign policy issues. And Israel being the third rail of American politics, his kowtows were the deepest and his head banged the most hard on the ground where Israel was concerned before both Senate foreign relations and House Foreign Affairs. So I, I actually, uh, I'm waiting to see uh, whether they will either say nothing uh, or reiterate Trump positions or potentially uh, uh, rescind them on these very important issues, legal issues. I think ICC is probably one of the most salient, but the others that I've mentioned are also important. And I, as of this moment, uh, we're now in March, the administration has been there since the 20th of January. Uh, some of these things are declaratory. They could simply say, something. There's not really anything required beyond that. It doesn't require legislative approval. But clearly the administration is running scared as far as uh, uh, criticism from its right on foreign policy. One can see that on China, on Russia, on Iran most notably, but also on Palestine. So uh, my hopes are not very high. Could I just add a word to what Rashid has said, uh, which I completely agree with. But I think what it also reflects is a decision to give domestic issues priority. I mean, and that that's, that Biden has made the decision that, that in order to create some minimal bipartisanship, he has to more or less accept the Republican outlook on foreign policy. And that will, uh, which is a kind of red meat for all these issues that you've spoken about, and that his presidency will be judged by the American people, by what, he, by what it does domestically, and not by, 
foreign policy. I think it's an unfortunate uh, miscalculation, even pragmatically, because it risks a Cold War with China and it has many uh, difficulties that are not predictable. But I think they've made that decision and it's reinforced, of course, by the factors you mentioned that Blinken has uh, articulated and really disappoint people that hope for at least a moderate re readjustment of what the damage Trump had done uh, over the four years he was president. No, I, I would agree with you. I would agree with you, Richard. Thank you. Um, there's a question for Hala. Um, based on Hala's talk, it sounds like Israel is once again engaging in a politics of deflection, trying to change the legal discussion about its sovereignty or lack of in the 1967 territories instead of its crimes. Is this scenario possible at this point in time? I would like to put a rider to that, if I may, Hala, um, with the very strong likelihood that the extreme right is going to have an even further grip on Israeli politics after the incoming elections. Is the ICC investigation going to stir the annexationist trend and perhaps uh, aggravate uh, that trend rather than uh, suppress it? Yes, uh, I think uh, well, it, it's, it will very much depend on the on the results of the Israeli elections. But I would, I would, I mean, what I would see coming if we talk, I, I would like to like present something else completely. We didn't hear mention, we didn't have the opportunity to talk about complementarity. Yes, and I foresee positive complementarity issue raising out of the Israeli elections, meaning that probably with, uh, with the United States uh, in the picture, probably what Israel would do, the new, I don't, we don't know who's the new government, but maybe to how to, to stop the proceedings from going on in the ICC to come and say uh, to the Palestinian Authority, let's come back to negotiations. And if they would say that, imagine what would happen. The ICC prosecutor, and I'm sure, it, he would he would not uh, 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 like continue. He would stop for a while and say, "Let us give them the opportunity to come back to peace negotiations." So, because we see that complementarity nowadays, where we talk about also positive complementarity and getting back the parties to to the negotiation table, because uh, the the the. the, the the existence of the International Criminal Court, international justice, and this is here we see a clash between the rights of the victims, the victims of the atrocities, and on the other hand, a, 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 the, the, the politics, the dynamics of the politics, of the regional politics, and what, what is, I mean, what is on stake here, and what would the international also uh, um, arena or international powers put pressure on and this is and I foresee unfortunately if this is would be the case and they would say to the Palestinian come back to the negotiation table and then we see again a delay in like the justice mechanism here for the victims of the Israelis violations are again are again paying the price of of the politics uh, formula here so my fear is from this issue. And I just would, would like to say also when we talk about uh, complementarity, uh, uh, I think Israel would rather have a difficulty with the issue of the settlements. With the, 19, uh, with the 2014 war uh, uh, on Gaza and the March of Return, Israel would come and say, well, I have an able legal system, very able legal system, and give me the chance to, to show you that I am an able legal system. But when it comes to settlements, Israel is in a real a, a problem here. And I, I think that politically it would do a, a step here not to a, arrive to that point when it has to defend its policy 
it's yes, years of policy of, of uh, encouraging and sustaining and financing the establishment of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. If I can just um, add on to those extremely wise comments um, on the that the issue of the peace process, it's both for complementarity and it also feeds the deferral at the Security Council because the Security Council can say, you know, international peace and security. Exactly. So I do think that that is something that is looming. It's looming for the situation of Palestine and, and potentially also for the situation of Afghanistan, which includes the US torture program, where we hear a lot of talk about peace talks again. And, the prosecutor was very pointed in her comments on opening the investigation in saying that peace and justice are not um, opposites, that you can have justice along with peace uh, negotiations. And again, I call on the international community to ensure that this is not a binary choice between what many of us would say is a false peace process and the possibility of real justice. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to bring this to, to an end. Um, I don't know whether anyone wants to uh, add anything or to sum up at the end, please, if you do, please feel free to do so in brief. Um, otherwise, uh, if not, uh, I want to thank you very much, all of you for these uh, very insightful comments uh, and uh, thank all those who've been with us for the past hour and uh, 40 minutes. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, and, we, and I hope this will be uh, stand as uh, our contribution from the IPS to this important debate. Thank you. Thank you.